That's how it goes, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a glitch at the first again. So, uh, Zoom just didn't want to pick up the, uh, the feed, but oh well, we're back and we're live. So, yeah, so that's just glitch at the first Zoom just didn't want to pick up oh, the. We got their feedback. Is your mic turned up? Heck was that? <laughs> yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's a little quieter. Hey. Thanks, Paul. Hey. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday night offering of, of astronomy edutainment. The Sunday, night, <laughs> Sunday night astronomy show. That's the way we start. There, after a rough start. My name is Chris Corwin. I'm an amateur astronomer. Uh, created the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay, and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I'm very pleased to welcome back my two co-hosts this evening, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshot Observatory in Beautiful Hampton. Hey, Paul. Hello, everybody. Hey. And uh, our other co-host this evening, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Mike. Good evening. Well, and we'd like to welcome all of you out there tonight who are joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. Now, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, there is a project happening in western New Brunswick which will provide a unique view of the coming solar eclipse. The project is to develop a balloon-borne solar telescope uh, that will be launched by means of an unmanned high-altitude balloon on April the 8th of 2024. This is no small feat, of course, and it takes countless, it took countless of hours to develop plan and conduct testing. Now, one of the gentlemen involved in the project, Mr. Stephen Downward, is, is here uh, joining us this evening to discuss the current state of the project and his involvement in making it a reality. Uh, Mr. Down, Mr. Downward is a computer science has a computer science degree from the University of New Brunswick and is currently involved in the communications programming and electrical components of the program. Welcome to the program, uh, Stephen. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to have uh, another great final bud target to watch for. Uh, Paul will provide another interesting Rosanna's Fun Facts. Uh, I'll present a few photo submissions that you uh, sent to me and we're going to talk a little bit about my a little bit of an update on my current contest going on. So sit back, grab yourself for your favorite beverage, and enjoy the show with us. And as always, uh, if you have any questions, please post them here. So let's get started then with the discussion around this unique idea for capturing the coming eclipse. Here we All go. right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess uh, I'll just start with sort of my role in the project. So uh, sure. like you said, I, uh, I mainly focus on the communications aspect of the uh, the payload. Um, so that corresponds to uh, you know high-speed uh, imagery as well as video. Uh, so we'll be sending imagery of the actual eclipse, and we'll also be sending uh, sort of a horizontal live feed. Uh, so the idea is you'll be able to see the uh, the shadow of the moon approaching from above the clouds, uh, and we'll be uh, streaming all that to the ground. And uh, we have a station on the ground, uh, which essentially picks that up and uh, sends it off to the internet. Um, so pretty much all the software on that side is uh, custom. So I, I wrote that, um, and I also built uh, the corresponding hardware. Well, so thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. 
it, it's an amazing feat to be able to offer, I mean, not only to get the balloon launched itself, but to offer the fact that we're going to have communications here live, you know, a live feed uh, distributed to five communities. So am I right? That, yep. That. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, we're streaming uh, publicly to YouTube now. Uh, so anyone can uh, can view it. Uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, come to Florenceville if you don't have the means or don't want to. Uh, we'll be uh, live streaming the whole thing on YouTube. So, is there so, a specific YouTube channel for that? Yeah. Uh, so there is. Um, I, I would recommend uh, staying tuned on our Facebook and Instagram pages and website. Uh, so we're, our website is eclipseplus.ca. Um, and we're also um, Eclipse Up Close on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so we'll be announcing the uh, YouTube channel very shortly. Yeah. OK. Um, so now there's the, you're, you're going to be doing this from various sites. Now, there's a number, I think there's a f four sites, five sites? I believe there's five. There's five sites. So, yep. so your portion of that's going to be uh, involved in getting the stream to those five sites? Yep. Uh, so I guess from my perspective, my main concern is just getting it uh, from the payload uh, all the way to YouTube. And then what happens from YouTube to the sites is sort of out of my hands, although we have done some testing on that uh, just to make sure everything will be reliable. But as long as the imaging, images and video gets you know, up to YouTube, I'm, I'm, I'll be happy with that uh, from my perspective, at least. Yeah, right on. You must be nervous. Time's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've done a couple of tests at this point, so I'm feeling fairly confident in uh good. in the communications, but uh Murphy's Law and all that, so can never be too sure until it's actually over. Yeah, right on. I know I'd be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so the five sites that are there now, there's uh Florenceville, Bristol. Um uh it's in Plaster Rock, I believe. For Perth, Plaster Rock. Yeah, Perth, I think, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know any of the sites, unfortunately. Uh, I, I've pretty much had my head down just working on the communication. I was just working on the, the Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm probably one of the most out of the loop people in terms <laughs> of the, uh, the rest of the project because, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I've pretty, pretty much been independent and we'll just uh, integrate my software with everything else, you know, when we need yeah. to. But uh, yeah. Well, I guess when it comes to projects like this, there's so many different components to consider that when you take one on, that's really the only one that you really. Uh, have time to focus on. So uh, yeah. I would, a lot of these projects, even when NASA's uh, sending something up or even at SpaceX or anybody, um, there's so many people that they rely on to do certain things. And um, and so they don't get to see a lot of the other parts of the project, I suppose. Eh? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's definitely, uh, you know, important to be able to sort of work independently, I guess, and in such a way that you can sort of integrate everything together. Um, yeah, it's definitely a very important part of the project. So when did you become part of the project? Uh, that's a good question. I think I joined around a year and a half ago at this point. Uh, okay. I was originally brought on just to do uh, some board design. Uh, so I, I really expected to you know spend maybe two hours tops on this project. I, I didn't <laughs> think I'd become a core contributor or anything. Um, and, and now I've done uh, quite a bit more than that. So I bet you have. <laughs> yeah. well, you've been involved for the whole from the from the um, from the birth of this thing? Uh, no, I haven't. So they, I, I was involved, you know, fairly early on, but uh, they had been planning for for quite a bit before I I joined. Okay. Um, so so did, did did they find you or did you find them? Uh, so they found me. Um, so there's a a guy named uh, Lewis Cobb, and uh, he was sort of involved with the project, and uh, you know, I met him at some point, and he he recommended that I you know check into it and uh, join to do a uh, board design. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So this is quite exciting for you, for you, and and, and basically everybody's now. Have you already met everybody, or is this going to be a first time for some of these people? Uh, so yeah, in terms of the uh, volunteers, I've met a decent number of them, but there's a there's one guy up in Ontario and one over in uh, Victoria, and uh, I haven't met them in person. Uh, we have weekly Zoom meetings uh, just for planning and, and such things, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I haven't I haven't met them in person yet. Yeah. So, um, so can you tell us a little bit about the design, um, in, uh, the part that you've worked on? And yeah, so uh, everything was pretty much custom. Uh, no one, as far as I'm aware, no one's really done, you know, live video from a balloon, uh, at least to this degree, with all the sort of extra parts added on. Uh, so it was really, you know, starting from scratch, starting at the ground level of, you know, designing the hardware. Uh, so we're doing, you know, FSK modulation, and then. On top of that, you stack your error correction. So the idea is if you have some bit flips, you can sort of correct for those. Uh, so we have to do that. And then on top of that is your actual like packets. So you have your imaging, 
your images in your video and you have to encapsulate them in packets uh, to send them down and you need some intelligence there so if you lose a packet you don't lose your video because uh, you know if you think about sort of the naive case if you if you built the system and it didn't have any understanding of you know the actual video content if it just treated it as a bunch of bytes uh, if you lose any of those bytes you essentially lose your place in the video and the whole video is destroyed from that point on mm -hmm. uh, so we encapsulate the video in something called mpeg ts which is mpeg transport stream uh, it's the same thing they use for uh, over the air tv like over the air digital tv uh, and the idea is mpeg ts will sort of you know packetize your stream in such a way that if you lose a packet it can just sort of throw away some of the frames and it'll just gracefully recover on its own uh, I'll also mention um, there's a project called WeNet, which uh, is an open source project that does a high speed uh, bullet imagery. And that was a, a really good jumping off point for the project. So uh, it, it does a lower data rate, but uh, especially for the ground station, uh, some of the code is reused from their project. The, uh, the payload side is pretty much all rewritten from scratch, but there's definitely some WeNet code uh, still uh, surviving in the payload, or sorry, in the ground station. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's so uh, interesting all the components, and I know you're only involved in a certain part of them. We were talking earlier, and you you knew a fair bit about um, the system that's going to keep the cameras in line. Could you could you tell us just a little bit about what you know on that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I'm not super familiar with it, but uh, the basic idea is most of our cameras are stationary, but we have uh, one camera. I guess they're all stationary, but one camera is sort of special because it has a mirror underneath it. Um, and the, the mirror is on a gimbal system, uh, so we call it the Agile Eye, and the idea is the mirror will keep the camera pointed at the sun, uh, so we don't have any you know heavy mass of the camera to move around, it's just the one mirror, and uh, you know we, we basically use software to keep the mirror in the right orientation that the camera can look at the sun. Yeah, it's fascinating. Oh, it's, it's... To power all this stuff, obviously, you need kind of a battery pack, but you'd be wanting to look at the smallest possible battery pack that you can get in order because of the weight and stuff like that. Uh, are you running a, like a 12 volt lithium ion or a 15 volt lithium ion battery pack? Yeah, so yeah, we've got a, a 12 volt lithium and uh, that we have a couple uh, uh, boost converters and butt converters. So we have uh, two 5 volt converters to run the pies. Um, one of those is just for the video system. Uh, video encoding just uses so much power that uh, we have one dedicated just for you know that section of the project. Yeah. Uh, we've also got a 15 volt converter. And that runs the uh, ADSB module. Uh, we're we're actually at the point where we're so heavy, uh, we need an a an ADSB module so uh, you know flight controllers can uh, know where our balloon is basically, and it needs its own uh, 15 volt power source. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to shoot that one down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea how much weight the whole payload is? Uh, I think it's somewhere around like 10 pounds. 10 pounds. Uh, yeah. Don't sorry. quote me on that, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely way up there. It's amazing how how much difference just even a pound can make. Yep, for sure. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. A, now, do you somebody, know if they have a system built into it where if it's headed on the wrong path or something like that, can they pop the balloon and bring it down? On yep. Their so own we or? have a so well, kind of. So we have a cut down unit. Um, we don't we don't have any way to trigger it from the ground other than um, sort of an experimental system. Right. Uh, but the the general idea is we can trigger it with a timer. Um, so on one of our test launches, the, the wind was actually strong enough that we, it, we would have gone into the Atlantic Ocean, basically. Um, but we, we were able to you know, set the cut down unit on a timer, and it went off right when we expected it to, and we basically had a graceful landing on land. Right OK. So how long is the feed going to be? Like, uh, how many minutes are you looking at streaming, I guess? Yeah, so the actual sort of launch time from takeoff to when it lands is, I think, about two hours, maybe two and a half. Uh, so we'll be streaming from shortly before takeoff um, to, I guess, shortly before landing. Uh, we're really limited by the curvature of the Earth once we get below. I mean, it depends on your horizontal dis distance, but below a couple kilometers when we're on the landing side, the, you know, the Earth gets in the way and we, we lose our video feed. Right, right, yeah. <clears throat> so well, <laughs> That's well, weird to think of, the Earth gets in the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny, um, on our first, uh, you know, successful launch, uh, we sort of, you know, there was cloud covering and the, the payload came below the clouds and uh, we got the video feed of the, the sort of road below and that's pretty much right where it cut out and that was a oh, really? really perfect timing. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So we are still talking about 100,000 feet, is that true? Like yep. we're planning on being, yeah? Yep. Yeah, so it, it goes up, gets up to about 100,000 feet and then it'll just burst nat naturally at that point. 
Uh, so the okay. cutdown unit is really if we want to do it earlier than that, which uh, we probably don't want to do unless uh, you know the winds are high like they were previously. So I was reading about that. I was reading about that. So when the balloon goes up, um, as it starts to get higher and higher with elevation, it starts to get larger and larger. So it's uh, it's quite small in size when it leaves the ground. But by the time it gets to the elevation it wants to go, is something a few feet large or larger than that? It's a, so on the ground, I don't have any concrete numbers, but on the ground, it's pretty large. Like I'd say, I don't know, at least a couple of feet on the ground. And when it gets up to the to altitude, it's significantly larger. Like I think it's, you know, on the order of a couple of times larger. Mm -hmm. uh, don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a sight to see when you're on the ground even. It's uh, quite large. Yeah, I, I don't know much about balloons, and to be honest, I, just what I've learned through you, you folks in the program that you're uh, that you're running, and uh, they're saying it can only go to a certain height because once it gets beyond that, it just like you said, it gets to a point where it'll actually just explode. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, so there, so there's um, a limiter to how high it goes up, because you have to retrieve it, right? Or or does is that how you retrieve it? Yeah. So the. The sort of normal case is the balloon will just pop and we'll retrieve it once it gets on the ground. Um, so yeah, like I said, we do have the cut down unit in case we, we need to cut it down at a lower altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, we generally just rely on it popping and coming down to the ground on its own. So there's a, there's an umbrella system on it or a, uh, some kind of a system that slows it down as it's falling? Yep, yeah, so we have a parachute on board and uh, for, for very small payloads, you don't necessarily need one, but uh, we're sort of well beyond that. So yeah, yeah we have a parachute on board. Yeah. So how, how long does do you believe it's going to take to get to 100,000 feet and stay up there? Um, yeah, I think uh, on the order of maybe 45 minutes. I'm just trying okay. to think from previous launches. Okay. It's a, it climbs at about five meters per second is what we target. Okay. So yeah, it pretty much just climbs and pops and comes down. So for a two-hour program, you're seeing 45 minutes up and then an hour and 15 minutes back down again? or? Roughly? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it. I think it goes down faster than it goes up. I'm, I'm trying to remember, but... Because uh, when it hits the ground, it'll be going at five meters per second. But oh. the ascent rate is constant just because of the, the way the physics works. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're on the parachute, you're sort of relying on the air and there's very little air at altitude. So it starts out quite fast and it'll slow yeah. down as it gets closer to the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've got a few questions here. Of course, uh, uh, lots of questions coming in, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, one here from Renat. Uh, what extensions do you see this? Uh, do you see for this work later? Do you see any? Um, possibilities of using this later on? Yeah, um, I think the system is a uh, you know super useful for any kind of high altitude balloon project, um, especially you know the, the communications I've been working on. Uh, I I'm definitely having a good time you know working on this project. I I would definitely like to do more high altitude ballooning after the eclipse. So mm -hmm. I'm sort of keeping that in the back of my mind that I want to reuse some of this code and hardware for that. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, and someone else says, uh, so we can, could you economize the bandwidth by intentionally dropping packets if it could fix itself? I'm not sure where that would go. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of like you, so the idea with four error correction is you make the packet bigger to, uh, to fit, to, you know, get that ability to, to, uh, flip bits. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea you can, you can strike a balance where you can almost, you know, choose an arbitrary packet size and. You know, the bigger you make the packets, the less efficient it'll be, but at the same time, the more robust it'll be. Um, and then in terms of actually dropping entire packets, uh, generally when that happens, you, you'll you lose the entire video for a few seconds. Uh, the, the way video is structured is you have what are called keyframes that holds like an entire frame. And then you have these sort of, I don't know what to call them, like deltas almost, where it's just the difference from the last frame. So when you lose a frame, you basically lose the video entirely until the next keyframe when it can actually rebuild the whole picture. Uh, okay. So you can't really uh, save bandwidth by, you know, dropping packets uh, on purpose. But uh, it's, it's mainly just in case we lose some uh, accidentally for some reason. Okay. Um, someone was asking what uh, cameras are being used. Um, can yep. Uh, I can I can certainly try. So uh, they're mainly Raspberry Pi cameras, um, and then we have one which is also a Raspberry Pi camera, but I believe it's an IMX four seven seven. I've actually got. You know the the video camera here. Uh, so this is sort of the system that I've been using to develop the hardware. So the board on top is uh, custom, so I designed that. Uh, and it's got a, a Pi on the bottom there that actually runs the software I wrote. And then connected on a little ribbon cable is the uh, actual camera there. Wow. And uh, so that's the the video camera there. It's a uh, very small. <laughs> very small, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
But it's designed to be a relatively wide angle, that particular one, is it? That one isn't super wide angle. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's an error or anything, but it's not like fisheye lens or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the one on the, uh, the Agile Eye itself is uh, quite, quite a bit wider. Um, we, we had some discussions about making it a fisheye lens, uh, and I think that's kind of up in the air right now. But yeah, it's generally a, a fairly wide, wide field, field yeah. of view. So depending again on what what it is you're trying to capture with with, uh, with each of the lenses, and I assume there's um, is it a telescope and a camera, or is it actually a, just a camera lens that they're actually capturing the eclipse with? Uh, I I'm not sure. I don't know much about the optical side of it. Um, okay. It, it looks like a you know it's a long lens to me, but I'm not an optics guy, so that's all I can really say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we were chatting earlier, and Mike actually has a um, an item he just ordered. And uh, which is the little flip? Filter. Yeah, you can tell, you can tell them about it, Mike. Oh, well, since the flip filter, I'm going to be, if I get the opportunity to photograph, of course, uh, I wanted to have a solar filter on my lens, on the end of my lens, and then without having to unscrew the solar filter and then get everything going, I wanted the quickest possible way that I could get that out of the way. And of course, you know, go on Amazon, start looking at it. They, can, they have these things called a flip filter. Basically, you screw your filter on. And if you don't want to use the filter, you just flip it up out of the way. It'll flip all the way back like 180 degrees or yeah, almost 180 degrees out of, out of, out of the way. So it just, instead of having to screw and screw on uh, a filter, when I'm finished with it, I just flip this thing up and it's out of the way, but it stays there. And then I can flip it back when I'm done. So I'm going to have my solar filter on during most of the eclipse. Then when it gets to totality, I can flip this out of the way with one lift of a finger <laughs> and continue on without having to mess around with it and miss the eclipse. <laughs> so that's the kind of same system, I think, or similar. Uh, they call it a toilet seat, I think. That's on. Yep. <laughs> that's on. That's on uh, the payload, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's going through you know some minor redesigns right now. We haven't completely finalized on what it'll look like, but uh, yeah, it, the concept is the same. It's a uh, it's a filter we can programmatically move into yeah. and out of the uh, the optical path. Right on. Uh, David Hunter's on here with us. Hey, David. <laughs> Uh, he says the payload weighs about 18 pounds, and the balloon is actually 92 inches on the ground, but 34 feet at its height. Expands wow. to 32 feet. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, knew, I knew it got big, but I didn't realize it got that big. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, I, thought, I thought I read 7 big. feet to 35 feet or something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's one big balloon. <laughs> that's one big balloon. Um, yep. Someone else asked, oh. uh, was, there, was there a thought of using a 360-degree camera for this task? Yeah. Um, so I guess in practice, that's a it's kind of difficult to accomplish because uh, you know you've got your payload in the way. So yeah, I I mean you could put it on top, but uh, you, you sort of lose that ground view. And I mean it's, it's definitely a, a different way to a, a you know solve the same problem kind of where you could sort of you know have a, a lower resolution view of the sun just because uh, you know more of your pixels are sort of spread around that sort of sphere of vision. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, you can't really send the, the raw video to the ground at that point, I don't think, just because of the uh, increased bandwidth requirements uh, you know, to send all that data. Um, right. Yeah, it, it'd definitely be interesting uh, for like a non-live thing where mm -hmm. you could just capture all that video locally and just retrieve it afterwards. Uh, but we're, we're focusing on a, uh, a live view. We, you know, we have to really just stick to the, the normal image, I suppose. Yeah, you, you mentioned also about, um, was it four cameras? That yep. they're running in sixty cycle um, or sixty second cycles, and they're in sync with each other within a fifteen second span. Yeah, it's something like that. So every every fifteen seconds, basically, a different camera will take a picture. Uh, so every camera individually, I believe, takes a picture every minute. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the the okay. Agile Eye camera is sort of separate from that. It'll it'll do its own. It's on its own timer basically, and it'll take them more often. Yeah. The agile camera is on a on a gimbal and, and it can rotate and follow the sun. Hopefully, with the payload, you said it, it could get spinning rather quickly at some points. Is yep, there yeah, to just stop uh, it from spinning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we looked into that. Um, it's difficult because, uh, I mean, the main thing you might think of is some kind of gy gyroscopic uh, mm -hmm. mechanism. Yeah. Uh, but then you've got sort of the weight to deal with there and the the power consumption of that. Um, so. The, our solution is is more on the software side uh, to just sort of correct it with our gimbal. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely, we put a lot of thought into that because uh, especially on our first launch, it really was uh, rotating quite fast at points. Yeah. And this is going to be like this 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 final launch 
is going like I think you had mentioned this will be the fourth launch. So you've had some practice with this, obviously. So Yep. Yeah. Um I, I'd like to think we got a lot of the kinks worked out on the last uh, few launches. Um but there is the fact that we're making change to the system, you know, between the last launch and now. So by definition there's gonna be some, you know, untested things on the platform. But mm -hmm. I think all the the major unknowns we sort of have out of the way at this point. Yeah, we've said that for four years of doing this show, and <laughs> quite got there yet. <laughs> I wish you better luck. <laughs> oh, it's it's a fantastic project. I, I'm so anxious to see this thing come come uh, come to fruition, uh, and I'm sure you are as well. <laughs> yep, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely uh, really exciting. I've been working on it for so long at this point that uh. I really, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, so, can... are you, so is there going to be like a little control room with everybody kind of in there or a spot that you guys are going to gather and collectively do this as one unit? Uh, kind of. So we do it outside. So it's uh, it's right next to the, the launch site, basically. So we're launching from uh, the Amsterdam Inn in uh, Florenceville. Yeah. Uh, so we basically have our, you know, we have a tarp and we set up our payload on the tarp. And then the ground station sort of set up, you know, a few dozen feet from the tarp. Uh, so I'll, I'll have my laptop and an extra screen and David brings a computer and his laptop and we basically set everything up there. So this is going to be the first time uh, all the people that are involved are going to actually be together? Yeah, I think so. Oh, that's fantastic. And yeah. of course, we're going to be up there too. So we're going to be at your location. So it'll be nice to actually meet you in person. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, say hello and... and so, um... so heaven forbid if the weather doesn't cooperate... <laughs> Is that going well, to pose it doesn't, you any issues? And this is a real success, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> is that going to pose you any issues with uh, with uh, streaming or, or rain? So, or yeah, from my perspective, with the <laughs> <laughs> at least in terms of the communication system, it's uh, fairly robust. Like I, I'd feel comfortable, you know, running out even in like a, a storm. Uh, for the rest of the payload, I, I'm not really sure on the exact conditions. Um, like, obviously, there's there's some conditions that we couldn't launch in, like if there was like a hurricane or something. Um, yeah. You know, I can't imagine we could cope with that. But, you know, there, there's we, we can cope with more than, you know, clouds, for instance. Like, that's the, the point of the project is if it's cloudy or weather's not great, we can go above the clouds and, you know, get a good view. Yeah, that's why we're doing it, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> now, for this eclipse, this is kind of unique as well. So it's the only balloon that I've heard of anywhere on the Internet that's actually going up to catch this eclipse by you know at what it is i mean everybody set up all kinds of balloons for other things but this is the only one doing it yeah. for this purpose that's pretty cool yeah it's um, Brunswick, no less right <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah. there was a question here a fella asked he says uh winds of high altitude uh like thirty five thousand feet are often very strong for example 100 knots uh, how do you keep the thing in the right place so as to see the eclipse shadow on the ground? Yeah. Um, so our the the main thing there is the uh, the wind predictions are are su super accurate in our experience. Um, so we have no control over what the payload is actually going to do, but we can predict from the ground where it's going to be. So uh, the the ba the the main thing we can tweak is sort of what time we we take the filter off, um, so that we can just look at where the balloon's going to be at the eclipse time and uh, compensate for that in the, the software that actually, you know, moves the uh, filter out of the way. Um, but yeah, there's there's no control over the payload beyond that. We can't uh, yeah. you know, redirect it or yeah. anything. Yeah, because it's a lot of uh, just free free floating, I guess, really to, to, to a certain point, I suppose. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I know on our last flight, I was seeing speeds as high as like, you know, 200 kilometers an hour that the payload mm -hmm. was actually moving at. Wow. Um, so yeah, there's not, not, an all, not a lot we can do to uh, counteract that. But yeah. It, the, relatively, the payload's moving the speed of the wind, so the payload doesn't really feel it because it's just moving the same speed. Yep. Yeah. I know when I was parachuting, you know, when the parachute opened up and I'm coming down, it was like, well, wow, it was windy when we jumped. Where's the wind? But yeah. I was moving <laughs> the same speed the wind was, so it's a, yep. it's relative, I guess, to the equipment. <laughs> so I, I would it, I I suppose it would depend on where the jet stream is too, would it or at all or. Yep. Yeah, I uh, sort of outside of the balloon project, I do a uh, you know radio sound hunting. Uh, okay. The idea there is a uh, you know there's a bunch of uh, institutions I guess that uh, launch balloons every 12 hours, and the the hardware is disposable. So if you track it down, you basically get to keep it. Um, so I every every day I'll basically look at the uh, the predictions for that, and uh, the weather does the the wind up there does change a lot between uh, every day. Okay, yeah. So you'll be keeping an eye on it right up to the minute, I suppose, before you launch, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly afterwards, for sure. 
Yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, so what what are people to expect? Like, because the, there's a lot of uh, these sites that are that are going to be set up, and we're going to be at one, of course, in Florenceville. But um, so, in, in your estimation, like, what's going to happen now? There, I know you don't know numbers, and that that doesn't really matter. But when somebody goes to this to the any one of these sites, what 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 do, what are they supposed to see? Yeah. So uh, the main thing is they'll have the uh, the full data we get from the payload. So there's going to be the the live video as well as the uh, the most recently received images. Uh, so you get both of those, both the, the video and the high quality images. Uh, we also show telemetry data. So that's going to be you know where the payload is, what altitude it's at. Um, I believe how fast it's rising and how fast it's moving horizontally. Um, yeah, those are those are the main things I'd say is is the the video imagery and telemetry. Uh, and then of course we also have a uh, narrators coming. So if you actually come to see it in person, you'll have a narrator sort of telling you uh, what's actually happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So will this yeah. be on, on the screen altogether or will it be flipping between? So uh, everything will be on the screen. The only thing that sort of flips is the images because it's just the, it's basically the last two that were received. So every time a new one comes down, it'll replace the the next oldest one. Okay. Yeah. And you were saying basically it's a, your job is to get it to a, a central point and then and then that central point distributes it out to the sites and exactly, so it's yep. going to be seeing basically the same thing in, at the same time yep yeah so we just stream it to youtube and then all the sites will pull from that youtube stream just like uh, any member of the public could right yeah so it's going to be uh youtube and uh bell one is it uh i believe it's just on youtube i could be, oh, YouTube. be wrong about that yeah okay mm -hmm. oh, well of course and the sites on the on the yeah. sites yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But the feed going out to YouTube is no, there's no, there's no narration during it. Nope. So yeah, it'll just be the the raw example. video basically. Yeah. So exactly. If you want to, if you want the narration, you should, uh, you know, head up in that direction and go to an actual site in person. Yeah. 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 Um, we're, we're actually going to be narrating the one where you are. And, um, and there was a lot of very detailed information that, uh, that your team had sent down and it's really actually quite, quite interesting to see, uh, how the, the this whole, process is going to unfold and then the, all of the things that um, that's going to be our job to talk a little bit about the eclipse first second third fourth contact Bailey all those wonderful things you're going to see and um, but just to be a part of this is really quite exciting for us um, you know we can't wait to get up there and then you know cross our fingers that we get good weather so that the whole of all of you designed on your payload captures everything not just uh above the clouds if there is those so we cross our fingers that there's none of them and uh, and this and then it'll be a like a hundred percent successful for you guys and that'll be uh, absolutely amazing for everybody i think have you, yeah, for sure. have you calculated the speed of the moon or the shadow will be when you when it arrives in our area or? so i haven't but uh that seems like something david would probably know <laughs> yeah i'm sure well, he's probably calculated it but, uh... it's uh it's faster as you get closer to the to our side of the of the eclipse of course right right yeah. um yeah oh it's amazing we're we're really excited about it for all of you and for us as well to, to be there sharing it with you so it's going to be so anybody who's out there wants to, to share it just come up and see us uh, Western NB, uh, eclipseplus.ca is where you want to go for information on it. Um, somebody asked, when you are live streaming during the totality phase, will someone be able to confirm when it is safe to remove eclipse glasses to see the spectacular sight with naked eye? I would think so. Yeah, there'll be somebody there. Uh, David says the shadows at 5,000 kilometers per hour. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 5,000 wow. kilometers per hour as it reaches us. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so Pat, so I, I would assume somebody will be there. Um, suggesting that it's time to you'll I mean you'll know anyway you'll 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 it'll be the diamond ring effect and then the Bailey speeds is the last thing that we have right that's that's as the the sun is passing through the the mountain ranges on the moon and that last little bit of sunlight comes through so once that hits glasses is it's glasses off time yeah and and just a um, note too so for those who don't know um if you are in uh, a partial eclipse anywhere of it you have to be in the total, total eclipse portion of it to be able to remove your sunglasses. Right. Any other thing, and if you're not in that total path, you can't remove your sunglasses at all. So, um, right. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people think, well, I got the glasses and I'm going to take them off at a certain time. But you, so it's really important to find out if where you are, uh, if you are in or uh, in the umbra or in the penumbra, I guess, uh, but the actual path what's considered the path of totality 
um, you have to be in that to take off the glasses. I just wanted to mention that because yeah. that's going to be a very important part of, uh, of all of this, I guess. And anybody yeah. wondering how to find out, Paul, they can go to timeandday.com and it'll tell them. Yeah. 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 Timeandday.com. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and if you are in that path, I mean, you've got three minutes to to stop and look around like not just at what you're you're viewing you know that magical event that's happening in, in front of your face but i mean also to take a look around the horizon and see what see what else is happening what are the animals doing what are the birds doing you know take, well, take there's, a there's a question that uh, that i kind of wonder then so uh, because if we a lot of people will go outside to look and we certainly re you know re recommend anybody do that but for those who can't get out and th and that's another big reason for why why you, you're you guys are doing what you're doing is for, so that everybody can enjoy this eclipse. So I guess my question to you would be um, uh, how I, and I guess we won't know until we see it, but how good will the video be? Um, and I know you had mentioned that sometimes you'll get some bumps and so on, but it'll be quite quite good, will it? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I. I... Like anecdotally, people have been uh, pretty impressed with it when they've seen it, uh, you know, on the ground. And uh, we did a, a test a little while ago where we actually put it on one of the projectors, and uh, pe people were quite satisfied with how it looks. So, uh, oh, perfect. Yeah. Good. Well, yeah. So that's uh, yeah, that's just wonderful. Uh, I still have the eclipse glasses available. Oh. <laughs> Tim Doucette says I still have eclipse glasses available <laughs> down at uh, Deep Sky Eye in. Uh, uh, Quinn in Nova Scotia, and uh, Tim will look after your eyeglasses if you don't have any. Okay, well, thanks very much. This is going to yeah. be an amazing day. We can't wait. I mean, we're less than 30 days away now, so, you know, the excitement is building everywhere, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks very oh, much yeah. for having me. That, been yeah, a yeah, thanks so much, uh, Stephen, and uh, we're looking forward to meeting you up there and then uh, and uh, all of us getting excited together about this whole thing. And thanks yeah, for your to this project. This is, this is of amazing. course. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on from there, then uh, right on to uh, Final Bud next. Want to let me share? <laughs> sure, hang on. I can do that. Uh, right here. There we go. There you go. And I think I want where's my this screen. All right. <laughs> Binocular Target of the Week this week by Bonobud. And yes, this picture has already been out on the internet, but the Leo triplet, <laughs> of all good things come in three. <laughs> it's funny because I said, I said to Chris, don't post, I'll post any picture you want but this one. But they got to, anyway. <laughs> all good things come in threes. So the Leo triplet, also known as M66 group, is a small group of galaxies about 35 million light years away from the constellation Leo. Uh, this galaxy group consists of spiral galaxies M65 and 66 and NGC 3628. The three large spiral galaxies can be seen in a single field of view and are well viewed even with small telescopes and binoculars. Uh, the galaxy disks are tilted at different angles when seen from the Earth. NGC uh, 3628 appears to be edge-on, while M65 and M66 are inclined enough to reveal their spiral arms. That's pretty cool, and it is quite the sight. How do I find it in the sky? Well, any other night but tonight again, where we seem to be in the Funday Nebula, uh, you walk outside, orient yourself right now at 120 degrees east to southeast at 2200 hours or 10 o'clock, look up, and you will see Leo high in the sky. And uh, if you look towards the back end of Leo, I guess you'd call this the tail, this triangle. These last two stars come straight down from them, and you'll pretty much be on the uh, Leo triplet. As you can see here, you can come down this triangle that make up the last three stars. Just come down from that and a little bit to the left, and it'll put you right on it, and uh, you'll be able to see it pretty well. What does it look like? Well, you're not going to see this because this is taken, obviously, through a telescope and a camera, but you can see three nice galaxies in there and one bright star. It stands out pretty good. In 10 by 50 binos, this is what you're going to see. So you'll make out that the galaxies are there. You see the, the three of them in this little group and then the white bright star that's kind of in the center of them. Really nice target, really easy to look at. Compared to the full moon, well, if you take the diameter of the three in a row, it's actually about the size of a full moon. So it's a fairly uh, large target, actually, and, and not too hard to see. And guess what? 
Did you hear about the new telescope company? Business is looking up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Painful oh, as they are. <laughs> That's <laughs> binocular <laughs> target of the week by Bono Bud. <laughs> oh, man. Painful. Yep. <laughs> so it looks like all three of us were desperate to call home. <laughs> <laughs> Phone home. <yeah. laughs> Oh, okay. Right. Um, let's go from there then over to uh, the Rosanna's fun fact. All right, let's do that. Let's see if I can make this work this time. For once in my life, I have someone who needs me. All right, and this is this week's Rosanna's fun fact. Hey, Rosanna. <laughs> Welcome back for another crazy and fun fun fact from our friend Rosanna. So let me just get things set up here so I can make things happen, number one. All right, let me just get that first picture up and ready to go. I'll get this off the screen. And my horse comp and mouse. Looks, sounds like a bunch of horses, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, now where did my thing go? There we go. All right, so Rosanna writes, uh, hi, Paul, Canadians are as a whole, have a lovely stereotype. We are known for maple syrup, hockey, cold weather, saying I'm sorry, and just general uh, politeness, eh? <laughs> and as Canadians, we tend to work hard and stay quiet in the background in regard to many of our nation's accomplishments. As everyone knows, it's not polite to brag. The Canadian mob, I'm giving you one last chance before Vinny says, please. <laughs> So this fun fact is going to preserve or sorry, present several news reports that I certainly wasn't aware of concerning uh, yeah, of concerning the Canadian Space Agency and other companies involved with their ongoing amazing work. Last week, we mentioned that Odessa's had touched down and fallen over uh, on the moon. In all the articles I read last week, the following detail wasn't mentioned. Odessa's carried a suite of 12 instruments, one of which was Canadian. The Canadian component built by the space systems company, Canadian, uh, uh, Canadensis, 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 I'm going to call it Canadensis, is uh, a miniaturized dual camera with one wide um, <clears throat> field lens and one telephoto lens that will point upwards to take images of the Milky Way galaxy as well as other astronomical objects, including the Earth. This camera and the company, Kinetisys, will both be uh, instrumental, no pun intended, in the long range plans to create a telescope and observatory on the south pole of the moon. Very cool. Now, Canada was actually the third, uh, three in my, and three being her favorite number, Rosanna's favorite number, country sent, uh, to send an object into space back in 1962. Launched on September the 29th, 1962, the Alouette 1 scientific satellite marked Canada's entry into the space age and was seen by many as initiating the most progressive space program of that era. With the Alouette launch, Canada became the first nation after the Russian and American superpowers to design and build its own artificial Earth satellite. Canada is probably best known for its uh, astronauts and the robotic Canada arm, but we also built satellites such as the Radarsat Constellation mission launched in 2019. I don't know if I can play that. If that's just a screenshot, that's just a screenshot. So the radar stack constellation constellation mission, that's hard to say, is Canada's third generation of Earth observation satellites. The three identical satellites work together to bring solutions to the key challenges for Canadians. Now, we also flew instruments to Mars, including one that measures cloud cover. The Phoenix mission marked the first time that Canada as a nation landed on the surface of Mars. Canada's me uh, meteorological station recorded the daily weather at the landing site. It measured Mars's temperature and pressure and probed clouds, fog and dust in Mars' lower atmosphere. Most significantly, the weather station confirmed that it snows on Mars by detecting snowflakes 
fallen from clouds about four kilometers above the spacecraft's landing. Of course, a Canadian instrument would discover snow, right? <laughs> so the Canadian Space Agency, or the CSA's, contribution to the Curiosity rover, centerpiece of the Mars Science Laboratory mission, is the Alpha Particle X-ray uh, Spectrometer uh, instrument. By examining the dust and rock of Mars's ancient environment, the mission is searching for answers to a question that has fascinated humanity for ages. Is there life out there in the universe? Canada's APXS instrument will help scientists get a, a clearer picture of the answer. As of May the 1st, 2022, APX had analyzed 1,211 samples and sent 2,659 results back to Earth. This image shows the APX on the NASA's Curiosity rover with the Martian landscape in the background. This image let researchers know that the APXs had no, uh, sorry, had not become caked with dust during Curiosity's landing. As mentioned in previous fun fact, I mentioned in a previous fun fact, Canadian instruments are also part of the James Webb Space Telescope. We are a space faring country, but we don't make a lot of noise about it. Rather than that uh, big build expensive, or sorry, rather than build big expensive rockets, we join with other countries and go along for the ride, a much cheaper way to explore space. While our instruments may uh, be small, they still make significant contributions every one of them could easily support a fun fact or two. And of course, sticking to our style, it wouldn't be very Canadian if we kept this news report just to us, or just to all about us. CBC reported that on February the 27th, India has finalized its four astronauts and picked that were picked for that country and uh, first and the first their first ever manned flight into space. Now, India introduced four crew members for its maiden uh, Gagnana uh, space voyage, and it aims to be the first to become, rather, the world's fourth country, U.S., Russia, China, to send a crewed mission into space just months after a historic landing on the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, uh, Gagnana, or the Skullcraft in Hindi, is the first mission of its kind for India and will cost about 90.23 billion rupees, which is 1.5 billion Canadian dollars. It involves the launch of um, the habitable space capsule over the next year to an orbit of 400 kilometers, and it's returned via a landing in the Indian Ocean. And in case you're counting, there are 28 days, 16 hours, 44 minutes, 33 seconds, give or take, until this happens. Oh my gosh, is everyone looking at me? Not everyone looks at me. Now it's your moment to shine. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this week's. Ah! Rosetta's Fun Fact. Hey! <laughs> wow. Interesting again. Wow. So no idea much going on space. in the world of space exploration. And, you know, with all what's going on in the world, with all the division, and all the craziness, it's nice to see that there is a collective uh, um, uh, something that we're all working on, and it just happens to be outside of our planet instead of on it. But in any event, it's nice to see all this stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rosanna. <laughs> you know, we were uh, we were in space in '62. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. And I, I knew what the radar sat missions, but yeah, and that's on Mars too. That's great. I mean, yeah. The weather forecast from Mars, cool. <laughs> Well, hopefully soon yeah. we'll be launching from Cape Breton, will we not? At the yeah, that's center right. down there that they're setting up. That goes, yeah. So somebody was saying, "What in God's green earth do we have to do to get a snaz hat?" <laughs> <laughs> Buy a black hat and get a white paint marker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I guess we're not answering that question. <laughs> Uh, that's coming. That's coming soon. I'll be talking about that uh, later. <laughs> okay. Um, let me get this. We got some photos to show. Not uh, do, 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 do. almost ready. Just screen. And 
Let's see here is this one. There you go. There we go. Look at that now. Oh, wow, wow. nice. Yeah. Joanne McGooey sent this one in. She said these were taken on the snowmobile trails near Sussex, New Brunswick on February 27th, 2024. The hut is a wolf snowmobile shelter. They're cool. Yeah, I guess there's quite a few of those out in the snowmobile trails, hey? Hmm. Yeah. And if you were a, a four-wheeler or a snowmobile guy, what a great opportunity to find some dark skies. Oh, yeah, right. really? Yeah. Wow. Right over here there. Yeah. That's oh. a, I, when I first looked at it, I said, is that Mike's observatory? <laughs> <laughs> a lot more light than that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Joanne, for those. You're great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go over here to uh, Jennifer's, uh, Jennifer DLG's uh, uh, image here. Uh, she says, hi, Chris. Well, I was very impressed with Haley Craswell's photograph of the monkey head nebula in January and started researching these, quote, smart telescopes for myself. I had two to choose from, suitable for a rank amateur, and settled on the ZWO Seastar 50. Now, attached is my first photo from it, taken Friday evening on March 8th. Uh, I left the unit on default settings for a first attempt, so ended up with a stacked image file, which I then edited, and she says, I think I'm hooked. Well, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. <clears throat> if that don't hook you, nothing will. <laughs> That's it. That's gorgeous. There you go. Get you another comment here, one second. Uh, da, da. Talk amongst yourselves for a second, because I got another picture coming up. I got to get the notes for it. Um, anyway, here's one here. This was from and uh, Audrey Sin uh, Sinoika. She said, "I forgot to send this to you earlier. This was on my iPhone on February the 15th." Wow! Beautiful. Wow! Sky's on fire. This was a sunset not to be missed. She said, "Taken at her home in Mesa's Bay." So, wow! Wow! Very That's nice. Cool. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, and I gotta go from here to something else here. Hang on. Bear with me. I'm just trying to bring up my notes on my phone. <laughs> I, I, I captured somebody's photo, but I didn't get their, their notes on it. So, one second. <laughs> anyway, these are coming, these come from Lourdes uh, Arrays. Uh, Rice. he says, uh, my name is Des from Riverview. I'm a follower of your Facebook page, which I truly enjoy. Thank you. Um, it's informative, educational, and entertaining content. He said, I'm a look up in the sky person too. I'd like to share with you some of the images that are captured by, by my phone. So here's one. It's nice solar pillar, right? Mm. Oh, beautiful, yeah. This is a great there. Very nice, yeah. Yeah, he's got this beautiful one here. Uh, wow. It's a nice colors. Beautiful. Where, where's it at, Chris? Did she say where she River, was? He's in River, Riverview. In Riverview, right? Wow, that's nice. And uh, a little one more here with a nice capture of the moon. There you go. Wow. Now I'm going to jump out here and go on to Captured by Kathy Adams. Oh, yes. M33. Look at that. Yeah, so that's a, that's a tough one to get because it, it doesn't have a lot of, it's face on to us. So it, it's difficult to capture that much light, right? Um, so two nights of imaging, approximately 110 minutes in, uh, integration time with her C-Star uh, 50. Uh, stacked in DSS and stretched and processed in Photoshop. She said, this is fun. And I can see that it is. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, that's a nice galaxy, eh? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, we've got this. I'm taking this one from Brad Perry. Uh, Brad says, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy and albeit tiny comet. I assume it's right here. Uh, where's the comet? Red's on here. He'll show us, I'm sure. Anyway, there's Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah. Um, at uh, Comet 12 P. Pons Brooks at 35 millimeter. I was originally planning on a tighter shot with just the comet in that distant mountain on the right. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. Okay. There it is. That is not. Well, he'll, he'll come back. <laughs> Watch yeah. Um, uh, but he said I would have uh, had to set up in a weird spot. Mac the Quack, New Brunswick, he said March 8th, 2024, 10 p.m. Fantastic shot, Brad. Mm. Nice. Nice to see Andromeda that big. I mean, Andromeda would be the size of six full moons if we could see it clearly in our sky. And it's 2.3 million light years away, so that's pretty big. Uh, this one came from Joey Croswell. Uh, this is Joey's uh, M81 and M82 captures. Mm. Uh, M81 and M82 galaxies are a pair of galaxies located in the constellation of Ursa Major. M81 Bode's galaxy is a spiral galaxy, while M82, the cigar galaxy, is an irregular galaxy at roughly the same distance away from Earth. Now, they are relatively easy to find with binoculars when you start at the Big Dipper. 
Bode's galaxy and the Savannah galaxy are often photographed together, as it's cool to see two bright galaxies in the same field of view. The third, more distant galaxy at the top is NGC 3077. And he says that, uh, where's his notes on this one? An ASCAR uh, FRA 400 at 280 millimeter, around one hour integration time. Now they're really well placed right now, too, almost straight up. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, Very nice. We've got the, uh, the hydrogen alpha nicely on the, on oh. the cigar. Now, didn't they say that they think this is because two galaxies collided together? What brought that in? Maybe so. I'm not quite sure. Actually, two galaxies, I think. Okay, we're going to go off from that, but that's great, Joey. Um, nice job. Nice image. Yes, this one here, it was M33 as well. Yes, sir. And I believe this one was taken to the C star. And thank you for that as well. So I'm going to carry on just for this for a second to uh, mention about our contest again. So I do have a, a contest up right now. It's for kids. Um, it's from, I guess, 5 to 14 years old. So there's a category of six, 5 to 6 years old, up to 10, and then 11 to 14. Um, so, of course, we're focusing on the eclipse right now. So I'm asking uh, people, to, to the kids, to draw a picture of what you think the eclipse might look like or how you will be celebrating it, family, friends, whatever. I'll have a parent take a picture of your drawing and submit it to astronomybythebay at gmail.com. Well, there's two categories for the entries, so 6 to 10-year-olds and 11 to 14-year-olds. Uh, please provide child's first name and age to be placed in the proper category. Um, prizes are going to be awarded through random draws, as they always are, and contest closes on March the 30th. The draw is going to take place on our SNAZ show on March the 31st. Now, all prizes have to be picked up locally and have to be claimed by April 15th, or they go back into the pot for the next contest. What are we talking about for prizes? Well, here's some of them right now. Uh, these are what I have so far. I've got a... Uh, uh, half a dozen space puzzles here, um, a nice big uh, sticker book with the uh, Atlas of Space. I've got a couple of these uh, 100 questions about outer space books on their way to me right now. And these uh, two of these super, uh, super cool space fact books as well. Um, and I'm going to go to one other one here in a second. Because I got another prize here to announce tonight. Here it is. Okay. And I also have this as the grand prize for the adult. Uh, so like the adult, the... Uh, the older kids uh, category from 11 to 14, this is a brand new uh, National Geographic, uh, I'll call Explore Scientific because it's their design basically, uh, 102 um, millimeter refractor telescope. So that's not a toy, it's, it's, a, it's the real thing, it's a real deal. So this is what we're giving away, it's a proximal retail value, that is $350. And that's going to be awarded uh, with our contest on uh, on the, uh, con the uh, draw on March 31st. So get your entries in, very simple contest, just a quick drawing uh, and send them in. And I had this one added to, uh, tonight uh, from Charlie from uh, Fireball Meteorites uh, offered these two uh, packages as well. So he said, uh, here are my donations for your contest, Lunar Meteorite Brecker 006. Both are whole stones weighing in at 1.4 grams each, an approximate value of each one of these is $100. So thank you very much, Charlie, for that. Great prizes there. So oh, nice. a piece of the moon for you if you enter the contest. So again, uh, the contest is very simple. Just draw, take a, a picture, uh, draw a picture of what you think the eclipse might look like and uh, have your parents send it into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. So let's get lots of entries in. I got a few so far. I want a lot more. And uh, if you have any images that you want to share with us, please send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And we'd be happy to put them on our next broadcast. That's all I get to say with that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and by, by the way, um, next week, we're going to have um, a local, not a local, because he's in Grand Manan, but he's local to the Maritimes. Uh, Kyle uh, Ingersoll will be on next week. Uh, if I can share my screen just for a moment, I'll just give you a, couple, a little idea of some of his photos that uh, we can look forward to talking about and um so he does uh, astrophotography from grand manan and uh he's a real enthusiast um and uh, so here are some of the products and images that he's done now lots of times he'll capture stuff um with his own uh, uh telescopes he's got a nine and a quarter inch uh, edge hd and also um I think it's 132 millimeter uh, fluorite 
a triplet uh, astrograph as well. And um, so he does he does some really, really nice stuff. He's uh, really, really deep into this, uh, into astrophotography, but he's also not all that, he hasn't been in it all that long. So he's doing some wonderful things. So he's gonna be our guest uh, next week on our, on our show. Awesome, looking forward to it. Yeah. Right okay, so that's our show for this evening. We hope you enjoyed the program again tonight. Special thanks, of course, goes out to Stephen Downward for joining us uh, this evening. It was great to have him on the show and to get an update on what's going on with the uh, Eclipse Balloon Project. Yeah. Uh, I believe we have one more talk coming in with one of the gentlemen uh, closer to the end of the month, which will fill us in on their final update for, for the event. Um, and we do have some special guests, like Paul mentioned, over the next few weeks at least. Uh, so uh, more on that uh, as we move forward. Special thanks, of course, goes out to Rosanna again, once again, for her fabulous fun fact statement. Thank you, Rosanna. And to all of you who share our program out there, Trudy, who shares it not a thousand places, whatever. <laughs> we do appreciate all the shares that you offer us. Remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'd be happy to share them on our next broadcast. And then a special thanks again to our friends at Rogers for joining us this evening. So until next week, uh, wishing you all clear skies. As we'd like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Open it up. Good luck. Night, everybody. And we'll share our sunscreen. Here we go, maybe.